So today I would like to talk about self-forgiveness, and that's uh, by request. I called this originally sin and self-forgiveness, but uh, because that's the context the question's asked in, and I hope, Bev, you don't mind if I say you're the one that asked the question, because I think it's a very good question. I would like to hear more about how forgiveness is the recognition of the spiritual purity of the soul. How does sin manifest itself when or if an individual does not forgive themselves? I suspect health, finances, relationships, etc. are affected. But what about the effect on a higher level? So I dropped the, uh, <clears throat> the idea of sin from the title just because I, this is not really about sin. What I don't want to give the impression is that we are returning to that type of language. The only reason I return to it is to explain it, is to explain how we look at it and how we look at it in a way that is far different from the way I learned to look at it. That is that we're all born into sin and that it is uh, essential that we are saved from that sin and if we're not saved you know the consequences you have a uh, there will no longer be a heating problem in your life we'll say that <laughs> but the uh, the I think most of us have been raised with the thought somehow uh, that we're inadequate and so that's what I think is one of the biggest challenges it's uh, interesting too that when we look at the early development of the Christian movement, we have the, the life of Jesus, and I think, as I have said, he taught what I refer to as the way, a natural way of living. And I've run into several scholars that uh, believe he was just a normal human being, that he did not go through all of the you know, death and resurrection. He went through the death, but not the resurrection and all of that. And they ground their their understanding in, uh, you know, their own research and so on. So when you look in the world of scholarship, you'll find everything. You'll find scholars that support every idea that you heard and a lot of ideas you have not. Uh, this particular scholar <clears throat> believed that Jesus taught poverty that it, poverty was a virtue, that denouncing the world was a virtue, and the uh, there was a whole movement that was centered around that. Uh, one of the founders supposedly, supposedly lived in a uh, ceramic jar, I mean a, a big ceramic jar, that was his home. And that would actually be better than a cardboard box, but uh, he totally denounced everything and you know just advocated the spiritual life and felt that things got in your way. So if you read the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, which are two volumes by the same author, and we don't know who that author is, but what you will find all through, especially Luke, well, Acts also, because um, in Acts, the early Christian community was to denounce all of their possessions, to put them in a, a community pile and, uh, you know, live in a, a communistic lifestyle. And <clears throat> that anyone who didn't do that, I think it was, uh, I can't remember which uh, disciple it was that caught two of them, a uh, husband wife that sold a piece of property and kept some of the proceeds to themselves. He cursed them and they both had heart attacks right there on the spot, so he didn't, didn't want to cross that guy. But so there's a, there's a, um, a school of scholars that think Jesus was a normal person who taught spiritual principles, but also advocated giving up uh, all of the world. And so uh, when you go through Luke, you'll see that there are many references to uh, kind of an anti-prosperity uh, uh, tone. Uh, his Sermon on the Mount is really a Sermon on the Plain. Jesus didn't give the same sermon up on a mountain. He came down on the plains and gave this sermon, but 
He said, blessed are the poor. And Matthew, who wrote to a Jewish audience, and the Jews were usually in charge of the finances of the world in their day, wherever they went, they would often be banished to a ghetto and they would turn that ghetto into a, a financial uh, wonder. Matthew, who wrote to the Jews, said, blessed are the poor in spirit. They were probably taking same verse or same saying from a, a similar source, but they changed the meaning entirely. But if you go through Luke, you'll see, Luke and Acts, you'll see there's a, a denouncing of material goods. And so that what this scholar is basing his thinking on is, uh, is that type of thing. And we don't know. You know, the, the bottom line is we don't know. But any, any picture you have of Jesus, you'll find a school of scholarship that supports it. And so it can be very confusing. But I have come myself to a place where I feel Jesus was a person who understood his connection with the infinite. And he was able to cut through all of the, the religious and mystical uh, jargon and was able to explain things in ways that the average person could understand. And I think that was his popularity. And then the writers of the Gospels come along and give us something else. Another way to think of this is think of the Gospel writers as writers of screenplays. They're writing a story. And they have adopted the character of Jesus to play a role in this story. And just like when we see a movie now and we see a character fit in very well to a particular role, we think of that character as that person. But in truth, we know they're not. They're not the same. There's a, a vast difference between the character that person plays and the person themselves. And I think that is a good analogy, a good way to think of the Gospels uh, as written scripts, and they gave Jesus a part to play. And they wrote his lines. And those lines were based on probably sayings that were passed down uh, for several, for a couple of generations, uh, for 40 years basically, by word of mouth, and were written down bits and pieces here and there. But if you think of it that way, you'll have a, a good idea of how the Gospels came about. That they are scripted, they're telling a story that Jesus himself probably was not telling. They were basing it on bits and pieces of what he said. But their script and all four of the Gospels pretty well match, although John is quite different. They pretty well match uh, the, the overall picture we can take from all four of them and, you know, have, have a Gospel, have one story. But uh, we have to take some uh, uh, liberties with those, with those doing that. But everybody does it. You know, when you're hearing a Sunday morning talk from any uh, preacher out there, it's going to be that. It's going to be a composite of the four Gospels. But anyway, this idea of sin plays in big time in the Gospels. And it's all about Jesus comes to save us of our sins, save us from our sins. And so it plays a big role. And so if if somebody comes along like Jesus and says a human being has the authority on earth to forgive sins, that freaks all the professionals out. They don't believe that's true. That would diminish their role, the need for professional clergy. If, as they saw Jesus, an average person, who is this guy? He's the son of a carpenter. What right does he have to say all these things? Where did he get this stuff? So they saw him as an ordinary person, as I believe Jesus himself saw himself, as an ordinary person who had discovered a dimension in himself that he knew was in all people. So this thing with sin is he tried to erase that. He tried to get people to see 
that that's not a permanent chain around your neck. That's a belief system that you picked up. You've learned how to do that. So this idea, I would like to hear more about how forgiveness is the recognition of the spiritual purity of the soul, which is quoting from my last week's talk. How does sin manifest itself when, if an individual does not forgive themselves? I suspect health, finances, relationships, etc. are affected. But what about the effect on the higher level? And uh, that all these areas in our life are affected by lack of self-forgiveness is true. And I'll address that. So in my book, The Complete Soul, I make a distinction between the soul and the self-image. I'm sure you're aware of that now. The soul is our true spiritual essence, that image likeness of God from Genesis. And whoever wrote that line had that awareness. And what we find all through the Bible is you'll find that awareness pop up and then you'll find it submerged. You'll find it pop up and submerged. Um, I equate that to thinking of a privacy fence and you drill holes all the, you know, the whole length of the fence and those holes represent mystical insights. It doesn't matter how old the Bible is, the mystic pops through. That uh, awareness of the purity of the soul and the presence of God, it pops through in all sections. People that say that the, the Bible is an evolution of spiritual awareness, I don't think that's correct. There are people who are completely enlightened in the beginning, the early days when the scriptures were written, to the later, latter days. That uh, this mystical awareness has popped through all phases, all areas of human experience. Time has nothing to do with it. So the soul is our true spiritual essence, that image likeness of God from Genesis. The self-image is the body-based personality that we've developed over time. Most people go through life identifying with the self-image. From this perspective, we sometimes make mistakes that can affect our sense of self-worth or the self-worth of another. And here's where sin has such a fertile ground. The self-image side of us, the part that we have developed over time, the body-based identity that we have, we make mistakes all the time. We do things that we think are not right. We may have negative thoughts. Has anybody had a negative thought today? Surely none of you have. I had one earlier this morning. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, if you get into this whole unity thinking, you're going to think, you know, I had a negative thought. That's bad. So you sin, and then to say, I sinned, and that's bad, is another sin. So it's just kind of a self-perpetuating problem. But that's all happening at a level that in the big picture doesn't matter. We will make mistakes when we can't see the whole picture. But are they really mistakes? Or are we doing the best we know with what we have, with the insight we have at this very moment? Do we think that there is a God up there with a ledger and every time we have a bad thought, every time we say something wrong or do something that's not so wonderful, that there's a check mark, you know, and it's being, a record is being kept of what we're doing. Well, they say in the, the near-death research, the life review is kind of like that. Like we remember everything that we've ever said, and we not only remember everything we've ever said or thought, but we know how it affected the people we said it to. And I think if there's a hell, that would probably be it, is having to sit through one of those sessions. But they say it, it's pretty quick. <clears throat> but the judge is not anything outside of the individual. It's the individual themselves that say, boy, I was really, I could have done a little bit better, I think. So it's not, um, we're not being judged or kept track of. And I don't understand how that works. I, I have no idea. It's such a bizarre thing, but it's so commonly reported that I believe it happens, and I believe we'll probably all be uh, faced with that, whatever, however you want to look at it, we'll have that opportunity. And it's always a positive thing. It's difficult for 
the person to sit there and relive all that, but they're also amazed by how much they recall. Can you re imagine recalling every thought you've ever thought? In just a few seconds, it just, you know, we can't even comprehend something like that. But anyway, that <clears throat> the self-image is where the whole sin thing plays out. It's not at the soul level. So people question, you know, if you behave badly, will you go to hell when you die? Well, all these people say there's no such thing as that. Well, not all of them. Some of them think there is. But <clears throat> there is uh, some of the worst kinds of people. And I'm talking about uh, things like mafia hitmen that have killed for a living. They'll get shot in the head or they get shot somewhere and they have a near-death experience and it's the most beautiful experience they've ever had in their life. And so they become social workers or they become something else. You know, when they come back, it changes their whole being. But <clears throat> what they say almost to the person is the heaven and hell thing, the sin and punishment thing is not a reality. It does not happen when you actually leave your body. So it's a construct that we have, that our professional religious people have come up with and used it, get in this club or else. It's a, it's a way to control. But uh, the mystic, like a uh, person like Jesus comes along and says, the son of man, the normal human being on earth has the ability to forgive sin unheard of, completely unheard of, but he had the insight to understand what that's all about and how to rise above it. <clears throat> so nothing we do or fail to do from the level of the self-image affects the, spirit, the spiritual purity of the soul. Jesus illustrated this in the Father's dismissive attitude toward his wayward sons and irresponsible self-destructive actions. The father did not forgive his son because he never condemned him. The father represents our soul. The son is our wandering self-image. And when we speak of the soul, we're speaking of the father. If you have seen me, the soul, you've seen the father. There's no separation. One is the expression of the other. And the soul is designed to pick up and express from the father level, from the spiritual level, but we are in a body that must look both ways. The whole consciousness, the whole body is a, an interface between the spiritual and the material realms. And the unfortunate thing that we've all done, every one of us have done this, is we have defined ourselves according to the body rather than the soul. We know we have a soul. We actually know at some level that we're not the body. But if I were to ask any one of you, how old are you? You would give me your body's age, right? Because if you said I'm eternal, I would say, you know, you are. And I would do the same if somebody asked me how old I am. I'd say I'm 68. And that's not even true because our bodies renew themselves. So the whole body is not 68. There's probably part of it that is. I don't know what part. But it's a, uh, it can be a confusing thing, but what are we? What is the I that I am? And we do associate it with the body. It's so convenient. It's, that's the thing we take care of while we're here. And we put so much energy and effort into it. And it goes through school and it gains a, a place, <clears throat> an identity. It's a little like uh, when uh, I was a ministerial student, we'd go over to, to Leavenworth uh, Prison and talk to the prisoners. It's a maximum security prison. And there was a prisoner that was about to be released after being there for 20 years. And he was scared to death because he said, out there I'm nobody, but here I'm somebody. And so he said, I'll be back here as soon as I can, which means <laughs> you don't want to be a 7-Eleven clerk when this guy shows up to buy a candy bar. He'll do anything he can to get back in there because that's where he is somebody. 
And in a very real sense, we have identified ourselves in that same way, but with our bodies. That this is what I am. And in truth, it's not what we are. It's a passing thing. And we don't want to deny it. We don't want to, uh, I don't believe in the, uh, you know, the, the course of the poverty seeker, you know, get rid of everything in your life and just devote your awareness, devote yourself, devote yourself to uh, the spiritual quest. Because I would have to say, if we came to this planet to deny it, why'd we come at all? Why do we waste our time? You know, we came here for a reason. We came here, I think, because we wanted to. We didn't come here to say, I don't want that. We came here because we wanted it. I believe that. I believe that we're here by choice. And we probably all have forgotten why we made that choice, what that was about. And I'm not sure that we have to remember it. But what I am sure of is that we need to put ourselves in perspective and to understand that we are not the body we inhabit it and we are puttering through this life in this vehicle that we call a physical body but it's not us and it does have problems you know every body has problems that we have to work through and what we do is we say i have a problem and that's not really true it's the soul never has that problem the body does. And so we start making that distinction. You know, my body's not feeling so well today or I'm not functioning so well today or whatever. But my soul is alive and expressing its perfect light right now. You know, to keep that awareness, keep that perspective. So how does sin manifest itself when and if an individual does not forgive themselves? In Jesus' story, there's no indication that the son forgave himself for his self-destructive choices. The likely consequence is that he carried a sense of guilt for receiving a homecoming celebration he believed he did not deserve. If you look at that story, there's no indication that the son was, gosh, uh, it all just goes away. You know, as he was coming home, he was planning on explaining to his father how bad he was, how he broke all the, all the rules. And, he was, and so he starts doing that, and the father just dismisses it, says, stop doing that. Let's have a party. We're happy that you came back. And that's a very difficult thing for the self-image to grasp. I've done something really that hurt somebody, so I deserve to be punished for that in some way. And there's nobody around that's going to punish me, so I'll punish myself. And that's the guilt that builds up, that we accept. But if we would say to ourselves, even the prodigal son did what he thought was best at the time. And that may be difficult to grasp, especially when we hear some horrendous crime or whatever. We don't want to take this to great extremes like that. Just keep it in your own life. But if you're carrying a sense of guilt because you think you've done something that has harmed somebody, something that is unforgivable in some way, you are operating at the body-based level, the body-based identity, the self-image. Guilt has no place at the soul level. And that, I think, is what one of the main uh, messages from the prodigal son. So this is a natural response to our mainstream Christian belief that our spiritual journey is about perfecting the self-image, saving it from the consequences of its missed marks. See, that's what the traditional mainstreamer thinks is going to be saved, is a self-image. When you lose your body, the first thing you're in a ditch is your self-image, the one you've been carrying around the whole time you've had this body because it has nothing to do with you. And you'll find that. I believe this is absolutely true. People say this time and time again, that everything I thought was important means nothing because it was all body-based. And again, that's not to say, let's deny the body. Let's, let's treat it as if it's just trash that we're having to carry around for this time, that we're here. 
That's not what it is at all. Respect, as Paul said, the temple is the, or the body is the temple of the living God. So we honor that. I wanted to experience this three-dimensional world, so I needed a vehicle to do it, and I've got it. And that's this. But I've made the mistake of thinking that I'm my car. <laughs> I'm my vehicle. And I'm not. I get in it, I drive it around, I get out of it, I get in it, drive it around, but it's not me. And I've known people that have so associated themselves with their cars that <clears throat> when they wreck their car, they think part of their life is missing. <laughs> well, we get attached to things. And it's okay to do that up to a point, or I think it is. We're not going to be eternally punished for anything. And that takes away the whole mainstream leverage of saying that you sinned and if you don't accept these rules and regulations, you got problems. The spiritual journey is not about perfecting the self-image. It's about recognizing the eternal purity of the soul. I am not my ever-changing self-image. I am the eternally changeless image and likeness of God. It is in our quiet times of inner stillness that this truth is revealed to us. That's the whole point of the exercise meditation is we take this self-image and we set it aside for a time. Very difficult to do. But we do our best to do that, to say, this is not me. Just for a little while, just keep your mouth shut. You know, just sit over here and don't bother me. And I'm going to see if I can find that true essence that I am. And with practice, ask, seek, and knock, persistence. The widow that wanted to get the judge's attention wouldn't leave him alone. That's the whole, the whole point, the whole idea. We have to be persistent in finding what is very close to us. It is us. And that seemed like a real contradiction. But it's true. That which we seek is us. That which, is, that which we are looking for, I think Meister Eckert said, is that which is doing the looking. And that's absolutely true. When Jesus spoke of a new birth, he was talking about changing our self-defining focus from the self-image to the soul. The quality of our overall experience is determined by how we define ourselves. The human being does indeed have the power to forgive sin. That powers the simple recognition of the spiritual purity of the soul. If you have not done so, I would highly recommend that you look at some of these near-death researchers um, like Peter Fenwick, for example, is a good um, one to look to, um, there's one, his last name is Long. He's got a wonderful website, um, Jeffrey Long, Dr. Jeffrey Long. These people are both doctors and their stories, the stories that they present us are very clear. There's a lot of woo stuff in the near-death field in case you haven't noticed. So you've got to be careful with it. It's, uh, some of it's just totally worthless, and some of it is uh, people on a big ego thing trying to sell books. But there are some researchers that are well worth listening to. Those are just two. Uh, Bruce Grayson is one of the founders of the IM's uh, organization. And that's, uh, I would recommend, because I think that is the best window that we have into who we are right now. It's people telling their stories, telling their experience that they were not expecting to have and coming up with something totally different than they thought. So there's no reason for any of us to carry guilt. There's no reason for us to condemn ourselves for anything. It's not that we've all been angels, but if you think you're gonna turn that self-image into an angel, you got another thing coming. It's not gonna happen. It is what it is, but your soul you are what you are. And that is the spiritual path is waking up to that. Okay? It's pretty simple, right? <laughs> okay. 
Well, thanks for coming out and stay warm or cool. I don't know which to tell you. Stay one or the other. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. If you'd like to help support this ministry, just click the donate card at the top right-hand corner of your screen. Your financial support means a lot to us. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.